So I'd like to welcome to the JPP, the Jewish Philanthropy Podcast, Sandy Carden. Sandy has over 25 years of experience in the philanthropy industry. He's a seasoned leader, strategist, and advisor who is passionate about creating positive social change and empowering communities. As the founder of Global Jury, he's leading a brand new initiative that aims to foster a sense of belonging and connection among Jews of diverse backgrounds and perspectives around the world. In addition to Global Jury, he also serves as a senior consultant at Crescent, a wealth management firm that helps clients achieve their philanthropic and impact goals. He leverages his expertise in organizational development, strategic planning, and international relations to, z- to design and implement effective solutions that align with their values and vision. He also runs his own consultancy firm where he provides guidance and support to various nonprofit organizations, foundations, and social enterprises on how to optimize their performance and impact. Sandy sounds like a perfect guest for the JPP. So I am very pleased to welcome you here to this platform. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So let's jump in. I always ask my guests, opening question, opening salvo, please share with our audience who you are in your own words. Well, um, I guess I'm someone who tends to define myself by the relationships I have with others, uh, starting with my wife, my children, my extended family, my friends, and, and my colleagues. I mean, if those relationships are good, then I feel like I'm living well. Uh, if not, uh, I'm the type of person who will try to fix the problem. Um, so that's a way I would define myself. And insofar as my identity is concerned, I think of myself first and foremost as a Jewish American. Um, I'm also optimistic most of the time, but being stretched on that right now. Um, I'm achievement oriented. I'm a sports enthusiast and I love uh, food, art and having a good time. Awesome. I also am a sports enthusiast and I also love food. Great. Um, I like having a good time too. The art yeah. part, I appreciate five things, but I but I hear that. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction. Sure. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about kind of where you grew up, a little bit about your parents, about your upbringing and how that kind of influenced kind of the work that you do today. For sure. Well, I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, lived almost my entire life um, up, you know, growing up just at, just at north of Baltimore City in a Pikesville area, which a lot of uh, your listeners are probably familiar with that that region. Okay. Um, I grew up in a conservative Jewish home, uh, keeping kosher and having Shabbat dinners with my family, including my grandparents, um, every Friday night. Uh, my grand, my parents were the greatest influences on my life. I love them very much, and I learned everything from them. Um, and I learned a lot about how, from how they live their lives, both together and individually. Um, most of your listeners are probably not familiar with my dad, but many of them may know the name Shoshana Carden. Shoshana was my mother. Um, she was born in Ramat Gan in 1926. She came with her parents to this country a few years later. Um, she ultimately, after marrying my dad and and um, teaching school for a little bit and doing some other things, she became involved, very involved in Jewish philanthropy and in the Jewish community, and ultimately um, rose to become the first woman who was ever head of the Council of Jewish Federations. She was oh. also the first woman ever to be the head of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. Oh. Um, she is also known... Um, most widely for her correcting, however, whatever language you want to use, President Bush, um, when President Bush said something that was not appropriate with regard to the Jewish lobby, um, she actually spoke privately to President Bush and had President Bush come out and apologize to the Jewish community for playing um, into or using what is otherwise uh, an anti-Semitic trope about the power of the Jewish lobby. Wow. Uh, she was a very impressive um, woman and um, really is was an inspiration and a motivation for so much that I do. My dad was also very involved in Jewish life. He left left much of that to my mother, but he was uh, an exec. I think he was a national vice president of the Jewish National Fund and involved in other iliomocenary kinds of things. He was a great man as well. So um, that was my upbringing. It was always 
um, have fun, live well, but you have responsibilities to the Jewish community and to the local community around you, and ultimately really to the world at large. Cool. I'm wondering, are you related to Senator Ben Cardin on any level? I mean, it's a... I am. I am. Senator Cardin is my my father's first cousin. So Senator oh. Cardin's father and my grandfather were brothers. Um, I'm also a relative of some of your listeners may know Rabbi Nina Beth Cardin, who is one of the first women ordained by the Jewish Theological Seminary. OK, fascinating. OK, I didn't do I didn't do enough homework here, but I'm, I'm glad that we're bringing this out uh, early in the in the conversation. So. It's clear to me kind of where the philanthropic roots are, but I'm curious, you, you must have, con I mean, I, well, you know what, before I even get to that, I want to, well, I'll, I'll get to Harvard in a second. We'll get to Harvard in a second, because I saw you went to Harvard for undergrad, and we yeah. should talk about what's going on in college campuses right now. But let me just, before we get to that, let's just talk about, so philanthropic roots clear. I'm just curious if you contemplated any other career track tracks or uh, for profit or how you ended up ultimately uh, deciding to go into this space? Yeah, well, absolutely. Not not only is it a question of, of deciding something else, I, I, I actually am very surprised that my career, my professional life took the turn that it did. Uh, I had, it was not originally, well, giving back was always important and, and um, being a, a volunteer and serving your community was always stress in the home and was something from the very beginning. Uh, I went after Harvard, I went to the University of Maryland School of Law. I practiced law with my father and my grandfather. I always anticipated that my uh, professional career would be wrapped up in both the family law firm and other businesses in which our family was involved. So that was what I expected, where I thought my life would take me. Um, there was just a turn of events um, back in 1985 that in, on the business side that really changed everything. And um, all, the life that I anticipated I would be leading was suddenly over. It was going to have to be a very different kind of life. Um, and it was not going to be with my father and my grandfather. So um, that is when, after a bit, it took a long time, but after... A long time I pivoted and and realized that uh, in my in my professional life what I enjoyed the most were the volunteer hours I was spending you know at breakfast at doing breakfast in the morning a volunteer breakfast and then um, volunteering for things in the evening and I was enjoying those much more than I was enjoying being a lawyer during the day and um, I decided that that didn't make any sense I needed to reverse that and I needed to um, think about how do I make nonprofit work and the communal work by full-time endeavor. And that's when I started um, my first position in that professional position was serving as a Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for uh, Karen Yerushalayim, working for Teddy Kollek, um, oh. an amazing, an amazing man um, in many respects and fascinating man in many respects. And that in that role was when I met Charlie and Lynn Schusterman, and ultimately became the, the president of the Schusterman Family Foundation. Mm -hmm. So I started out thinking I would be a, on a much more traditional lawyer, businessman, giving that, you know, during the day and giving back in the evenings and, um, and mornings, and then turned it around and ended up being a full time uh, professional in the nonprofit world. How long did you practice law for? It was brief. I mean, I, I, well, I actually had two little episodes. So I started practicing law, uh, I would say, in the 1982 to mid 85, maybe a few years there. And then I practiced again um, from about um, 90 to 92. Um, and then uh, that was when I decided and ultimately went over to uh, Karen Yerushalayim. In the meantime, um, I, I, was doing some real estate work and a variety of other things, um, none of which were as fulfilling and meaningful as ultimately what my career in philanthropy brought me. Interesting. Did you ever consider politics or, or no? I actually ran for a state office right out of a college. So in 1978, I ran for the state legislature um, and I, I did not prevail. Um, I went, went to college the four years later, the next time the election came up, um, I decided to wait uh, and not run that time because I was still young. And some of the same things that people were saying about me four years earlier, I hadn't really changed enough, I thought. 
And then the opportunity was not there the four years later. So um, that was my one foray. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have participated. I learned a lot from it, um, but never went back to it. Got it, got it. And not, not to pry too much, but uh, you mentioned it was kind of this very sudden shift. I'm, I'm just, I'm gleaning me. It wasn't something that you expected. And I guess it just kind of forced you in a different pathway. I don't know Correct. If that it, or was, believe it. it was not at all what, what was expected. We were involved as a family. Uh, we were involved in uh, banking and savings and loans. And there was a savings and loan crisis and the savings and loan crisis and repercussions of it just sort of led to a whole a whole change, um, which in retrospect, um, you know, I, I learned a lot from the experience and it led me in a direction that I think ultimately made my professional career more fulfilling and more meaningful than it ever would have been otherwise. OK, good. Great response. Let's talk a little bit about Harvard. Uh, you have to obviously be living at a. In a, in a foxhole or something, not to know kind of uh, what's what's been going on and what's been happening across American campuses. How do you feel as a as a Harvard alumni, kind of watching uh, events unfold? Well, I feel um, I'm I'm extremely disappointed not not only with Harvard but with um, so many other a academic institutions, Ivy League and otherwise. Um, I don't, I'm not somebody who has an affiliation to their university in such a way that I feel such a deep part of it. I mean, Harvard's a huge institution and I was happy to go there. I was proud, you know, happy to be accepted and proud to to be able to say I went to Harvard. It means a lot more, I will say, to other people than it really means to me, which is one of the benefits of, of having gone there. Um, but I don't feel like it, um, the challenges that have been going on at Harvard are somehow um, uh, I don't take them personally in terms of of the way the university is be or not behaving or not behaving as the case may be. Um, I think that um, that what's happening at universities is unacceptable. I think the the um, the administrations of these universities are um, are feckless. They're not doing what they need to do um, with regard to. Uh, students and outside agitators, regardless of what the issue is. Um, of course, I'm very concerned about the issue. I'm a very proud Zionist. As I said, my mom was born in, in or Palestine and Israel. Um, and I think it's disgusting. But the that issue aside, um, there have to be rules and regulations and responsibility. People need to have responsibilities, not just rights. And I don't think the universities are by any stretch of the imagination holding people responsible for their actions. They are, in fact, in many cases, as we know, rewarding bad actors. And I think that's a very, very bad precedent. But I, I also think, sadly, that it is um, it is symptomatic of things that are happening in society, uh, you know, society at large. And when we're moving into a world where truth doesn't matter, um, it's a very that's a very, very dangerous place. In many respects, it's completely unprecedented, certainly in a democratic society. And um, the, these are we're going to have to be dealing with these aspects of things for a long time, I think. Yeah, no, it's definitely frightening. I'm curious just also you hear frequently, particularly about Harvard, that there that the anti-Semitism has roots for many, many years. I'm curious in your in your tenure there, I think you said that uh, you graduated a while ago. Right. Did you feel anything, let's say, in, I think, 1978, maybe you said? Did you feel anything yeah. that uh, at that period when you, when, when you were in school or, or not so much? No, I mean, we knew you knew the history, right? You knew the history just of, of, of Harvard and others having Jewish quotas and so forth. And so you, you knew um, that you were going to an institution um, where the, the notion of being Jewish um, ha had it had a role, right? And sometimes in a negative role and sometimes um, in a positive way because it was an institution that had Jewish presidents, right? I mean, so uh, it, it, it's a comp it was a complicated thing. I did not face sort of outright anti-Semitism when I was there, um, but I didn't do a lot of things. I was not so overtly right. Jewish. I was not really, I think I went to Hillel in the beginning of freshman week to see what it was like. I'm not sure I ever went back again. Um, that was not really, being Jewish was an essential part of who I was, but it wasn't out, my outward identity while I was there. And, um, I, you know, I was engaged, having gone to a 
private school not far from there, um, uh, and you know, and what would be considered an elite boarding school, Milton Academy. Um, I was used to living in sort of straddling both worlds. I was used to being a Jewish person in a very sort of Brahmin environment. So um, I encountered questions about religion and jokes about anti-Semitism, but that's how I took it. Yeah. Um, I didn't take it as as uh, being the kind of anti-Semitism about which I needed to worry. I took it as sort of stereotypical kinds of things that people would make jokes about. Um, and I think even until recently, I, I think I, um, I'm one of the many who underestimated the real level of anti-Semitism in society at large. Um, we know it's there, but I think many of us thought it's not so bad. Or mm -hmm. next, you know, it could never happen here, right? And when we said it could never happen here, <laughs> we really meant it, right? We were pretty secure in that. And I think what's happened more recently is to suggest that um, we can't take that for granted. We were wrong to do that, that the, these problems are out there. They persist. They may have been swept under the rug and buried pretty deeply, but they've come back to the surface. Right. And yet it's confusing because like when you pay attention to kind of like the polls, like most Americans do support Israel. And so it's it's a little bit confusing, right? When you see these kind of outbursts of anti-Semitism on the other hand. It's 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 the next. I I see it as kind of more like it's that next generation. Like it's it's almost more frightening in terms of where things are going. I think you know people in our age range, give or take, are are more pro Israel, are are less uh, anti Semitic. Maybe not, can't say for sure, but like that's my sense. And it's more kind of these the younger demographic that is you know from the indoctrination from these campuses. I don't know if, if you agree or disagree with that. Well, I think, I mean, I, it's it's a very complicated, complex kind of thing, right? Because the bottom line is that we know that there's no particular justification for anti-Semitism, right? It just exists, right? It's an ism that just exists. So there's no, there's no justification for it. So what is it that would have this next generation be worse than, the, than generations before? Um, I think it's a question of agitation. It's a question of what's um, allowable in society. It's what what do people think is okay to say or okay to do. Um, that's what gives rise to these this resurgence or these outbursts of anti-Semitism. Because if society doesn't suggest that it's a terrible thing and it shouldn't be done, then people will express it. So I I I'm not sure that anti-Semitism is the reality is any more today or less today than it was generations ago. What seems to be what's so frightening and so disturbing is what seems to be okay is to be anti-Semitic today. That right. seems to be something that is permissible. There's some sense that there's a justification, whether it you use Israel and, and Gaza or what whatever justification you use. For being anti-Semitic, that seems to be uh, more allowable today than it's been in the past. And so we have to deal with this issue, I think, at the macro level in order to contain it. The micro level, anti-Semitism has always existed, as long as Jews have existed, and it will always exist. But what we have to do is make sure that in proper society, in, in civilization, and in civil discourse, that it's not okay to be anti-Semitic. Got it. Okay, interesting. Let's talk a little bit about your tenure at, at Schustermitt Foundation, right? I think you were there about 25 years, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes sir. Uh, it's a, a pretty broad, you know, swath, expanse of your career. Share with us kind of some of the, briefly, some of the highlights over that uh, period of time. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity if you can be in the midst of a great organization with great people where you wake up every day with essentially unlimited resources trying to do good. And um, there's nothing there, there's nothing like it. Uh, you know, when we think about our personal lives and we think about business, um, the money is all money. The resources are always, um, you know, at the front of our minds, maybe not all, the first thing, but it's the first two or three things. Um, and, the, and when you're in a position where money is no issue. It gives you a liberty to think about things in a very, very different way. And that's one of the beauties of being of working at a foundation and uh, working with a family with tremendous resources who has decided that they want to use those resources for something good. 
And in this case, the Schustermans were um, very interested. Charles and Lynn, sort of the first generation, uh, really wanted to focus the vast majority of their resources on the Jewish community and how to ensure that Judaism continues and Jews can not just survive, but thrive. Um, later, so after I've left the foundation, the foundation is larger in terms of its financial resources and broader in terms of its agenda under the leadership of, of Stacey Schusterman, uh, the daughter of Charles and Lynn. Back when I was there, it really was essentially a Jewish foundation. That's, that's really where we focus. We also did some important things in the local community, but it was more local and Jewish than, than uh, the breadth that it has today. So um, we did some interesting things. We met interesting people. I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry to say that looking back, you know, 25 years on 25 years of work, um, I'm not sure how far we were helpful in advancing the Jewish people. I think we've got some real challenges today. It's not clear to me that um, that Jewish life or the Jewish world is in a much better place today than it was then. I think in many ways. Um, we're facing greater challenges than we did um, back then. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done, I think, in in strengthening the Jewish people, in in holding us together and helping us think um, about how what responsibilities do we have to each other and to the world at large. And that's a particularly Charlie Schusterman of blessed memory used to have a great saying that it's hard to think about draining the swamp when you're knee deep in alligators. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of where we are. I see where the Jewish community is today. Um, we're knee deep in alligators with regard to what's happening in Israel and resurging anti-Semitism all over the world. But we've got to think about draining the swamp. We've got to think about um, Jewish unity and we've got to think about tikkun olam. How do we help make the world a better place? If we lose sight of that, we lose sight of what is essentially it means to be Jewish. And that would be a huge loss for us and for the world at large. That's probably a, a good segue to what you're doing today, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for sure. It's why I've I've decided to right now to be spending almost all of my time working on this new project called Global Jewry, because I think um, there's a great fragmentation uh, within the Jewish community and the Jewish world. And we all know why. Um, that is. We also understand that probably the last time we were united as a people was standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. And even that, we had our challenges when we were there. Um, right. So it's not that I have some Pollyannish, ridiculous sense that um, we'll all, all Jews will come together and, and, um, and, and we'll all make Shabbat together one day. That's not the historical fact, and it's probably not going to happen in the future. But we can do much better in terms of, of thinking about ourselves as one people, one family than we're doing today. Um, in order to do that, we need to stop, I think, looking first and foremost at the way we engage individually with um, our Judaism and the Jewish people and think more broadly, uh, thinking first initially that we're part of one family, one people. If we can do that, if we can sort of flip the script, if you will, of how we think about ourselves as Jews, then I think we give ourselves a better chance of coming together, strengthening the ties that bind us, and working together as a people to help each other and help the world at large. Yeah, I, I think many of us appreciate kind of the the messaging, and you know it's hard to argue with the need for unity, despite what we often see in our fractured communities. I'm curious, so practically, kind of how do you envision implementing this? broad vision that many of us talk about, how do you convert it from platitudes into action, into reality? How, how do you envision that? That is the question. Um, the Because we started, when we started Global Jewry, we did not have a plan. We just had a goal in mind, right? And thinking about how we were going to do this, other than my jokingly turning to my wife and saying, I'm going to do this one Jew at a time. There, are, there aren't that many of us. So uh, if I talk to one Jew every day, I only have, what, 15 million days where I have to get this thing done. Um, but I, I, that's really the question. I, I, think, I think we're going to end up doing this in a number of ways. First and foremost, um, the message itself is really important. In many ways, the message is the mission. 
that we we're so wrapped up in things that are going on around us and we're so bombarded by all sorts of different things that it's easy to forget um other than in just passing that we're one people that we're one family it's it's we we tend to think about ourselves more in terms of divisions and differences than in likenesses and what we share. It's just the way our dialogue goes. Everything is harping on and demonstrating what's different. What's different about Israeli Jews versus American Jews? What's different between Orthodox Jews and conservative Jews? What's different between older generations of Jews and younger generations of Jews? That's where our conversations almost always go. Our conversations rarely go to what unites us. What are the shared values? What's the shared culture? What do we share in terms of where we're going in the future? And so just promoting that conversation, I think, is a very important part of how we can achieve our agenda. A second part of how we can achieve our agenda is that if we can help, if Global Jewry can help um, organizations cooperate and collaborate more with one another. It'll do two things. Number one, there's a lot, there's amazing programming and content out there in the Jewish world that if each organization only reaches but such a small segment of the Jewish people, right? It, it's, 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 there are very few organizations that are, that reach the totality of the Jewish people. Almost none, I would say. And so if we can find ways to help organizations collaborate and cooperate, the programming, the content that each of them is developing, um, it, it, we can we can cross pollinate and we can use that to help more and more Jews understand really the majesty and the beauty and the depth of the Jewish people, the Jewish religion, the Jewish culture. We don't do that enough. And organizations are busy and they're stressed, particularly now. And so they don't have the time really to think about how do they broaden their own message. They've got to work with their constituencies. If global jury, we can find the ways to give them that time or make it easy for them to collaborate and cooperate, then their message can reach more people and more people can be informed by it and understand the totality of what's happening in the Jewish community. That's that's number two. Number three is, as you can see, we're building, we have two, over 220 some organizational partners. We have over 600, 700 Jewish leaders on our advisory board. Um, if we, again, can create a sense of um, tearing down the silos and spreading the, a ripple effect of the sense of one family, the sense of one people, we can we can create this buzz. We can create this sound throughout the Jewish world that keeps resonating about being one people, one family. And if we can keep that going and people hear that in the background of their lives, perhaps they'll begin to think differently and we'll have the kind of connections that we'd like to see. What's the most positive feedback you've, you've heard or seen or experienced thus far? Well, I think most of the people that I talk to about it say we've we, you, absolutely your timing is perfect. Uh, we've we've never needed to be together more than we need right now. There's so many issues that we're confronting and fighting. Some that we didn't expect, others that we knew about. So your timing is perfect. I'm so we're so glad you're on the scene. What can we do to help? That's really the the best feedback we get. Interesting. Okay, cool. So it it remains to be seen. It's a work in progress, but it sounds uh, sounds exciting, and I'll uh, affirm what you're hearing that it's extraordinarily necessary. So uh, great, thank so, you. And we're coming up to our um, we launched or at least announced it on the uh, third yard site of my dear friend Ilya Salita, with whom I worked at the Genesis Philanthropy Group after leaving Schusterman. And so his fourth yard site is coming up. We'll be doing a couple of events. Um, and in a sense, um, launching, if you will, now that we've had a year of thinking about what we want to do, what the foundation, what's possible, how, you know, bringing people on board. So in about two or three weeks, we're going to be announcing some events, doing some things, and then going into year two. And in year two, I think we'll be really be able to focus on um, how we achieve our mission. We spent the first year thinking about what do we need in order to achieve it. Okay, cool. Sounds great. Tell me where you were on October 7th. Tell me how you found out about what was going on in Israel and tell me kind of 
how it's impacted you and how it's changed kind of the way you go about your life over the last uh, eight months or so. Yeah. Um, October 7th, I was at home. Um, there wasn't anything special going on. And um, just when I woke up, there were text messages and emails and calls and saying, you know, this is uh, taking place. And I think like everyone else, I was um, horrified. Um, I, I, I just didn't know sort of how to respond. It was just so horrific, um, so unexpected, so jarring um, that um, it just, like so many, it just took the breath right out of me. I didn't know. Um, I just didn't know. It's like, you know, receiving a, a sort of a sucker punch to the head and you just, you just sort of sit back and, and you're just amazed at, at what sort of just happened. And you, it takes a while for it to, um, to resonate and to really understand what was going on. Um, and then after that, it was of course, checking to make sure um, people that I knew, were they okay? Um, or were they not okay? What did they need if they were not? Um, what could I do to help? Um, we, fortunately, in in my case, we were already working on global Jewry. And so um, being able to reach people, contact people, and and begin to try and address, help address what, in whatever way we could, uh, that was something that I could do from the very from the very beginning. It was um, certainly not something we ever anticipated, of course, uh, but it was in a position. So the the good, the only good out of it is that I didn't have that sense of helplessness or feeling uh, or not feeling that there was some role I could play because of where we were. And um, and then as time went on, um, it became more and more important. We actually were working very closely um, with Alan Futterman, who's a friend of mine who was helping us at Global Jewry. He now is the director of the Kafar Aza Foundation. And well, so we were um, we, we were engaged in these kinds of conversations and things right when it happened and continue to do so to this day. Very interesting. Uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about philanthropy with you. You know, you, you've kind of you've seen it from a lot of different vantage points over the years. Nobody has unlimited resources, you know, even when you work for a well-endowed foundation, you know, there obviously have to be priorities. How do you see kind of, I guess you advise a lot of people in the space, kind of how do you, how do you see or how do you guide people in terms of, obviously it's subjective, everybody's interests are different, but how do you, well, let's start this way. How do you go about your own uh, philanthropic priorities in terms of how you decide where to allocate resources, where you don't, what's your thought process? For yourself and then maybe share a little bit how you kind of use that extrapolate from that to try to help others sure um I, look the first thing i think about when i think about uh philanthropy and think about tzedakah because it, it's it's important that that word was so prevalent around the house and we had our jnf pushkis and and so forth so um that was you know that's the, your formative kind of thing I mentioned that because when I think about philanthropy, I think about giving. Um, I, my, first and foremost, I think about the Jewish people. I think about contributing to Jewish organizations and Jewish causes, both on one hand, because I'm Jewish and proud and and want to do that and, and feel I have a responsibility to do that. The other is that we're so small. Right. And we we need to take care of ourselves. There are every the the rest of the world is not going to take care of us. We need to take care of ourselves and that therefore I have no no problem, no qualms in my own intellectually thinking that the bulk of my philanthropy should go to the Jewish community just because the Jewish community, the resources that are available to the Jewish community are much smaller, although we do have very wealthy Jewish families and institutions. Um, it's still the, re the totality of the resources that are available for Jewish causes is smaller. And therefore, that's where I choose to direct the bulk of my giving. Um, the others are, are in causes and things that, that are important to me. Um, in terms of, of what, where to give once you make that decision, 
my I you know without the resources on a personal level clearly I don't have the same resources as the Schusterman family or the Schusterman Foundation so I like to try and figure out a way to make the resources that I do have available um, a, as helpful as possible to an organization or to a person it's uh, the resources that I have that are going to charitable organizations they're not going to make a difference on the root cause of anything I just don't have that kind of of money. What I can do is give resources to organizations that will help individuals and help people achieve certain things or address certain challenges. That's where um, I think that the, the resources that I give can go. So I think when I, if you're asking about advising other people, that's part of the challenge. It's how much money do you bring to the table? What do you care about? How much money did you? I'll give you an example. This is like a silly example, but it happened to be at the United Hut Solid dinner last night in New York City. Okay, right. There were twelve hundred plus people in the room, on the spot. Again, I'm sure it was a little bit of a showcase, and it was a little bit planted in advance. I'm sure, but you know, they they put up there. We're going to raise. It's the first time I was ever at a dinner like this, where we're going to raise twelve million dollars right here in the room right now. Right. I ended up raising twenty. Okay, you know, whatever, fine. But like, and people are going a million dollars. Uh, you know, seven two hundred twenty five thousand dollars, seventy two thousand. You know, uh, there were a few people like a thousand dollars. It was like almost like embarrassing to say a thousand dollars. Like, what's the point? You know, it's like, it's like uh, you know, it's like it goes to your point. And I wonder, kind of like, no, obviously every thousand dollars adds up, but it is an interesting kind of, uh, you know, conundrum for for quote unquote the smaller people. How to how do they approach their philanthropy? For sure. And and look, that's an important cause and especially right now. Right. So but I, what I would say is if, you know, if you're in the position of a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars may be much, much more important to you than it is to the to a large organization like that that's raising 20 million dollars. So is there is there even another way if you want to address sort of the same cause? Is there another organization or a smaller organization? Maybe that thousand dollars would be used differently um in order to address sort of the same thing that's what i would take a look at it how do you know uh, i mean that's an interesting question like how would you like how does what make like a startup or how, how does what assess that yeah well you you have to do a little bit of research and you understand who's work what organizations are working in that sphere a startup the the, the a startup could be great the, the the challenge of a startup may be, in many ways interestingly is the same as the challenge of a large institution which is the money that you're giving may not go it may not be used Used for the ultimate purpose, it, it'll be general and it's helpful. I don't, I don't mean to suggest any that any gift is a bad gift, but if you want to make sure that your resources are going to some particular person or thing, whatever it is, then both a startup and a large have the same challenges. Startup need needs money. A startup needs money to just get going, and the large organization has high GNA, right? High general administrative expenses. So in both of those cases. Um, your resources may be going there. If that's not what you want, then you have to find somebody in the middle where they've got that covered, but the, and they but they agree to use your resources for the specific purpose that you want. Uh, but but all, dip organizations, different organizations function differently. You just have to do the research. You have to ask some questions. No, it's very interesting. I wonder how many people, I mean, I think on the higher levels, right, the, the Schusterman level, people are very thoughtful thoughtful about the about their philanthropy i think on the mom and pop level you know some more some less like it's just okay it's a good organization good name i'll give like it's interesting in terms of the sophistication even the individual can have in terms of how they assess where to allocate that's what you're yeah and today i think you know with websites and and the things like charity navigator and the, all these different things you can you can actually spend a fair amount of time and um, researching and understanding where your resources go. And I, I think it's uh, it's worthwhile. Now, if you don't want to do that, you, you know these organizations and you're, you're not wasting your money by giving it to them. And I would never want anybody listening to this podcast to suggest that I'm saying anything uh, like that. Uh, not at all. But I am saying if, if you want to focus. The other thing is there are lots of organizations that, um, uh, you know, offer matching grants or their and or and corporations and so forth so think about the opportunities where you can leverage your money um into even more money for the cause that you care about now some matching grants are are pretty much for show meaning that the donor is going to give anyway but they it 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 
you know, they say it's going to be a matching grant. Uh, and so that's two for one. Even so, you at least know that that donor is giving that kind of money. Real matching grants where it's a real kind of thing and with corporations who wouldn't be giving it otherwise. That's a great way to give your money to causes that you care about and really leverage it because it's $2 or $3 for every dollar you give. And I would urge people to think about those opportunities because they can really make a difference. Very interesting. No, it's fascinating. And and what would you say in terms of like the very large scale? I, I was just for example for fun, right? So, uh, uh, Jeff Jeff Bezos's ex wife, right? I'm, I'm blanking on her name right now, but she Mackenzie uh, Mackenzie, right? So she was giving out you know inordinate sums of money all over the place. But say you were her philanthropic advisor, I'm sure she has like maybe you are. I don't know. I was like, like how, how does how does somebody like that really you know how do they? What's a good way for somebody like that to decide kind of uh, how to distribute those sums of money? Well, I think for her, first of all, I applaud for what, what she's doing because uh, she is shedding a light on the importance of giving to organizations and letting the organizations make the decision on how to utilize the funds to achieve the objectives as opposed to sitting back and trying to direct the, how those monies are used, even though that's not your expertise. Um, just because you're smart and made a lot of money or inherited a lot of money doesn't mean you know how to run a not-for-profit or that you know the most effective way to achieve the objective that the not-for-profit is, is doing. The, in theory, the people who are running it know that. So I think the way you decide what kind of problems, what issues are of greatest importance to you, where do you want to make a difference, you find the best people who are running and the best organizations that are doing that, the most effective, the most efficient, the most innovative, the most creative, and you give them the money and say, go to it, go do your thing. Um, it's often spoken about in terms of philanthropy as betting on the jockey, right? Um, you bet on the jockey to ride that horse to achieve the objective that you want to achieve, knowing that they know more about this than you do. Now, it's not to say that you can't have an opinion or won't have a conversation with them or don't want to talk to them and all the rest of it. I'm not just saying just throw the money and go home. But what I am saying is let the people who know the field the best do what they do best and let them be the guide as to how those resources should be spent. The best ones are going to use it in the most effective, most efficient way. And you're going to get the greatest good for your resources if you allow them to do that. The worst thing you can do is try and try and force an organization to do something that they don't really want to do or in which they're not expert experts just to get your name somewhere on a building or a program or something else. That's the worst that can happen for all involved. And I would say that happens way too often in philanthropy. Interesting. Bet the jockey is something you hear in the financial world. It's something you hear in stock investing, right? It's something that, that you know, you have to, you have to pick the. Yeah. And by the way, the, the, the fact is that the NGOs, not for profits, it's, it is an investment. You're investing. Um, your return is different. It's not necessarily a financial return, but your return is a social return. And, and it's the same, the same concepts um, uh, apply. Now, it's not, I'm not somebody who says NGOs and businesses are exactly the same, and you have to run an NGO like a business and all the rest of it. Um, I don't think you have to go that far. But I do think that you need to recognize that organizations are organizations, people are people, and there's a lot to be learned um, at the, in the nonprofit sector from the profit sector and vice versa. And um, you should take the best practices, and the most promising practices in all areas and apply them to the work that you're doing. That's how you have the greatest chance of success. No, I hear that. I, I think also I find that I'm sure there's exceptions to this, but it seems to me that any space that somebody cares about, like, you know, you have United Hatzala, you have my game, David Adon. You know, I'm in the space, let's say, uh, special needs children, like even just within the Orthodox world, and I'm sure beyond as well, there's a multiplicity of organizations that are more or less serving the same demographic. Like it's, 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 it, it seems to be like there's, on the one hand, it's beautiful. Like our community as a whole has so many resources. On the other hand, like it seems like there's almost a lot of overlap, a lot of repetition. And I think it makes it harder to kind of really discern who's doing what, why are these things necessary? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I, I totally agree with you. It does make it hard to do that. 
um, the, the, the real shame, it seems to me, is we do have a lot of resources, but we don't have as much as we need. And the real shame is when there are a multitude of organizations trying to or pursuing the same objective or the same mission. And um, they're basically indistinguishable, except for maybe who the donors behind them. And, and what that means is that we are duplicating expenses. Um, and, and uh, you know, whether it's in terms of, well, it's less rent today now that more people work at home, but all sorts of expenses that you could probably go away if what you're trying to do is address a particular issue and you'd have more money that could go towards addressing the issue rather than to, um, to overhead and to general administrative kinds of things. So I think within the Jewish community, um, if we were able to combine some of these and we had, as I said, break down some of the silos, break down some of the barriers, we would actually unleash um, unleash more resources for the for the kind of issue that we're trying to to uh, address. We would also allow, I think, for the best ideas to flow to the largest number of people. In other words, if you're a small organization that's really doing great work, um, and you have great ideas, but you're small, it would be incredibly helpful if what you knew and what you were doing was being used by a larger organization. That tends not to happen in our community. Right. And we're too small. Um, we, we really can't afford that in the long run. And so maybe we'll find a way for organizations to, if not merge, collaborate and cooperate more, reduce the kind of expenses and the costs that, that are not going directly to providing a service or a program and find ways to increase resources in that direction. Right. That would be great. Sadly, that, that, you know, that would probably advocate for a lot of not-for-profit professionals who are, you know, making sacrifices inherently to lose their jobs. Right. I mean, that's like, I'm not saying that's the ultimate value, but that's, that's, that's the service. That's the value, but it is a conundrum, right? You can only have one, it's, CEO, you know, you have three CEOs of three organizations. I'm just saying, for example. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And that's part of the reason why we have what we have. I, I guess I would say that if if you could do it in a very thoughtful way, um, then I think there'd be room. It's not that we're always going to need, and, and certainly in the nonprofit sector, um, for serving people, we're going to need more and more people. That this isn't, we're not, I don't AI and technology is not gonna, is not gonna. Um, overtake the not-for-profit industry too much, helping people. It's not going to work that way. So we're always going to need more people. I think that there's room for the people. I don't know that you'd see such a such a loss in terms of, of the professionals doing that. I actually think that if we did it right, if we could, you would see an expansion. They would have uh, more responsibility and be able to work with more people by doing yeah. that, not the other yeah. way around. But yeah. that that would have to be done in a very thoughtful way. You're yeah. right. If yeah. it's not done in a thoughtful way, then yes, the pain may be um, more than the benefit. Well, it's, it's cool. I like what you're saying. It actually makes a lot of sense. It's a sophisticated approach. Again, people are thinking this this globally uh, on some level, but I think there's a lot of value there potentially in what we're saying. We're going to wrap up. It was a final question. I always like to ask uh Time went pretty quick. I like to ask uh, maybe just one uh, one piece of advice you'd leave our listeners with. Maybe a good piece of advice, a bad piece of advice, uh, whatever pops into your head. I'd love to hear some thoughts. Sure. Uh, the one one piece of advice I think that, uh, and I have, and I have many. I've had a lot of great mentors, including my mom and dad, who have taught me lots of things. Uh, but the one piece of advice I I guess that sticks out. Uh, has always stuck out to me from a colleague of Zivron Livracha, Karen Barth, who once looked and said, you know what, it's not okay to be a critic unless you have a solution. Um, and 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 I, I've always thought about that and, and it has always stuck with me because to be in a room and just say that doesn't work or that's not good um, doesn't really advance the conversation. All it does is is aggravate people, put people in a defensive, create a negative environment. So if you're going to say that, at least be ready to off, offer an alternative. And if you to, to, to find to be a critic, it's fine to question things, but have an alternative ready. Just to say that's no good isn't really as helpful yeah. as B, as as A saying nothing or B being critical, but have offering a solution, offering an alternative that can move the conversation forward. Excellent, excellent. Sadie, thank you so much for this uh, 
enlightening conversation. I want to wish you continued success with Global Jury. We need it now more than ever. And uh, thank you for making the time to speak to our audience. Well, thank you. And thank you for your participation.